I am so grateful and excited to have you here today, Eva Robin. Welcome to Sensitive Matters. Salam Pagi. Salam Pagi. Yeah. Thank you <laughs> for having me. Such an honor. I know you've been here here in Bali for quite some time and <laughs> have been doing incredible work. And I'm I'm curious how that journey became became to be that you became a midwife. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. That's a big question. Mm -hmm. I feel like I was uh, kind of hijacked by the women here. Um, I had been studying midwifery and um, I was an author of my first book back then, After the Baby's Birth, and teaching childbirth education in Hawaii, where I had lived for 13 years. And then coming here to Bali, we really came just for a short visit and just a reset for our family. And immediately when I arrived here, I became pregnant with my son, Hanuman. And then I was offered a job. Linda Garland from the Bamboo Foundation, uh, she offered me a job teaching. And I was teaching children who, uh, many of them were half Indonesians, mixed race children from all over the world. And they didn't have a school that they could go to here. So she provided that and I was their teacher. So it was an incredible opportunity to stay a year and was perfect for my family at that time. Uh, so from that, uh, my pregnancy continued. I became close to other pregnant women and I was seeking prenatal care and things like that here. And I found that the midwives here in Bali were sharing with me their hardships and their stories. And um, then soon after my son was born, uh, Dr. Ines Susante, who did the study for UNICEF, where she investigated in the mid 80s, every death in Bali. And she found that the leading cause of death was not people who are sick or elderly. It was women right after they had babies, they were hemorrhaging to death after childbirth. Mm -hmm. So it was people in the prime of their lives. Mm -hmm. And most Balinese women were really only having one or two children because there was a, from the 70s, there was dua anak cukup, two children enough. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like they were having nine or 10 or 11 children. They were having just one or two, and yet they were dying in childbirth. And I started to look for answers as to why. And I was, as stumped as was Dr. Susanti. And we decided to look at maybe, because so often postpartum hemorrhage is nutritional, maybe there was something that happened nutritionally that happened across the entire population and why. And um, I went to Mankulia, who's, um, he was an incredible healer. And uh, he was, here in Palasakan, which mm -hmm. we're sitting right now, right between Mipuni and Palasakan village. And I went to him and he told me that it happened overnight. And it, and he also was attending births as a Dukun Bayi, a traditional birth attendant, mm -hmm. which is interesting because in Bali is very, something rare was happening for many generations. Men were attending births mm -hmm. as, as traditional midwives. And, um, it's a phenomenon that we don't see often in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, he felt that it was an incredible honor that culturally he was being invited to birth mm -hmm. or soon after he would be invited or if there was a problem. And this is at a time when we were just starting to get, he was, he was very old when he died not long ago, but they were starting to have hospitals and medical care here. But remember, when you come as far as Ubud, there were roads and transportation were not readily available. And so uh, he said that they changed the rice, that Balinese were eating the, their heritage red, red rice, which had all the nutrients to support life, you know? And then suddenly uh, the Green Revolution, which is kind of like in animal speak, it's like, uh, you know, in animal farm, they talked about double speak. Um, and in, in that um, double speak, not animal speak, animals speak truth, but in the animal farm book, we talked. they talked about how people sometimes would say something and mean another, but to call that rice green revolution wasn't true. 
It was a rice that was, instead of two crops a year, you got three crops. Mm -hmm. And it had to be sprayed with fungicides, pesticides, all kinds of things. And it had to be harvested and then polished down to be the white, white rice because of all the chemicals used to grow it. And so overnight, it became a government mandate to grow this rice. And this rice was just starch. It only had one nutrient. It provided energy through starch, which when you chewed it in your mouth became sugar. We saw the rise in diabetes, hypertension, all kinds of health issues, but that took more time. What happened almost immediately um, when this rice was being used, being universally implemented throughout Bali, was that women began to bleed to death when they had their babies. And um, it was such a profound change and it was so shocking um, that also the traditional birth attendants were no longer uh, brani or brave to attend births. They were being also told not to attend births because birth became an emergency. Before that, mm -hmm. birth was not an emergency here in Bali. You know, when people ate organic foods, I, my grandmother was a hilot, which is a dukenbai or traditional midwife and healer in the Philippines before, during, and after World War II. Mm -hmm. And she saw the changes also uh, when, when organic food became unavailable. As long as women ate organic food, um, they were fine, and they did fine in childbirth. Um, the, one of the heads of Department of Health, who's now retired, but when I was in the Philippines, she, was, she and her husband were delivered by my grandmother. And they told me that she never lost a baby or a mother when there was no hospital. And during the war, you can imagine the situation. But because women were well-nourished, and she explained that to me. So, and she lived to be 97. And uh, so here I was, um, a young birth keeper. Uh, I had to go back and finish my midwifery exams so that I could do something about this. Dr. Susante sat with me many times and said, and she showed me her studies, and she said, please do something. Maybe something can be done. Mm -hmm. And there was, of course, the medical answer, which was out of reach for people that couldn't afford it or didn't have transportation. And I will say that the medical systems for mothers and babies here in Indonesia have improved so much in the 30 years I've been here. So... Mm -hmm. It's, a, and it's, it's an exciting time. At Boom Sehat, I work with 16 midwives. Uh, two of them are volunteers, and they're young, and 14 of them are on staff. Usually the volunteers will go on staff, but we really try to support the education of midwives uh, so that if a, if a young girl has a dream and she wants to be a midwife in a country that needs midwives, we will support her education. And then she'll usually come to Boom Sehat and work for nine months or a year, and then we try to really get her back in her village. Mm -hmm. But um, also now in Indonesia, it's really required for the midwives to have continuing education and mm -hmm. advanced degrees. And so uh, we're actually helping some of the elder midwives or the more experienced midwives go back to school and get their advanced degrees. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we found was that it was really quite easy in a culture like Bali to implement a human rights-based, gentle childbirth, respectful care model. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's what really generation, not even maybe two, three generations at the most or before, that's what they had with their traditional birth attendants. Yeah. So Bumi Sehat became kind of a bridge between um, a medicalized version of uh, mother-baby care which hasn't really been culturally appropriate for any woman anywhere in the world. Mm. And it was implemented here. But we're the bridge between that medicalized care and the traditional care, which is much more spiritual, which mm. is, you know, we think of each and every person as, you know, a spirit first, a soul, and then body, mind, spirit, all of that. We try to integrate all of that kind of care, which is very Balinese, tree here, Pakarana. Mm -hmm you know, which is human's relationship with, with spirit or God, human's relationship with humans, and human's relationship with the earth, you know, with, their, with their earth mother. Mm -hmm. And so since that is um, its basic 
here on our island, it was easy to implement. And then beyond that, we implemented it. And now we're in four locations in Indonesia and two in the Philippines. Amazing. Wow. We love what we do. It's it's clearly so needed. And the, like my whole system is just melting. Also hearing about the integration, right? Because I feel that's like that's what needs to happen right there's these countries where there is a lot more access but it feels like that soul and that spirit got lost a little bit and to really have these three layers mm-hmm. oh yes. <laughs> it's it's worth the, the, live constantly. the pandemic did sort of um make it more difficult to do respectful care but we were able to prove with our good statistics and our happy happy mothers that uh, even when you have to wear personal protective equipment even when you have to do special testing for mothers even when you have to have really uh, more strict medical protocols to protect people we did prove that mothers could be just as satisfied just as happy just as respected and well cared for And we like to say mother baby and not put any space between them because we do keep the mother baby together. We don't separate them. When we say hut doesn't have a nursery, (laughs) it doesn't have a baby room because the best place for a baby is right here, skin to skin with mother. And we have really tried to keep a family model of care. But what happened just as the pandemic was coming on just before that, was that FIGO, the Federation International Gynecologists and Obstetricians, they're the umbrella for all OBGYNs in the world. Their organization uh, started asking the question, why is it that women after childbirth love their midwives? They love their doulas. Doulas are women who mother the mother. They actually love the nurses, but they don't like their doctors anymore. And most of them will not go to the same doctor for two births or three births in a row, they will change out. Hmm. And so they started asking that question. They started asking us, the birth keeper, the women. And the women were saying, well, look at the quality of care you're given. It's medically amazing, but it's spiritually lacking. And it's, it's not respectful. It's not culturally appropriate. And they looked at all the vision and mission statements in the world. And what they liked was the International Mother Baby Friendly Childbirth Initiative which was something pioneered by women a long, long time ago, uh, who uh, people like um, Mary Kroger, Deborah Pascali Bonara, who's our mm-hmm. orgasmic birth pioneer, uh, Ina May Gaskin, many women all over the world, the, the, the La Leche League, the, the breastfeeding organization, all working together, um, they came up with 10 steps for respectful childbirth for that would serve women, mothers, babies, families. And what happened was, is they looked at that respectful care model and they wanted to adopt that as the OBGYN's international vision and mission statement. So a little tweaking happened, everybody working together, especially, you know, everyone go online and look up international childbirth initiative. There's 12 steps now, and it really does support women in any culture, in any setting, in any economic place in their lives. Um, and it's it's now, it's here, and we have it. It's translated into 23 languages. Bumi Sehat put it into Bahasa Indonesia and also Tagalog, and Ware Ware, which is a Filipino, um, Central Philippines language. So it's going into more languages, of course. But it is a framework for on which people who are helping with childbirth can not just have medicalized scientific protocols because science saves lives we need science but we can't throw away spirit you know it's the tree heart to hit the karana we have to have our relationship with humans and that's mm-hmm. science but we have to have our relationship with spirit with mm-hmm. what makes us feel safe especially as women and then our relationship with nature mm-hmm. And which is why if you go to Bumi Seha, people love the garden. There's a big organic garden and there's a big garden and mothers in labor are walking barefoot um, because they find that the earth mother helps them through their labors. You know, there's a circle of support and inside that circle of support is 
the mother in the middle. I mean, you look at the chains you're wearing. Each link of the chain is important. And if there's one weak link, the chain will fall. It will break. But look at who's in the middle. The woman is in the middle. And you see women. I have seen women in I've been to Bangladesh working with Hope Foundation in the Rohingya camps. I've been to Nepal after the big earthquakes there. Uh, I, you know, we've all over the world, we see women. And if they have any way of getting a tiny little gold chain, they will wear that gold chain. Yeah. And it's a symbol of the golden circle of support. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's passed down through generations and that, you know, her mother is a chain, a link in the chain. Her partner is a link in the chain. Her sisters, her girlfriends, her doula, her midwife, her doctor, and and the Earth Mother is a link in that chain. And her who who does she talk to when she prays? And that's why every single mother at Bumi Sehat gets to choose a song, and we sing that song to her when she's pushing her baby out. So oh. as we start to see the baby emerging from the mothers beautiful labia her from her secret sacred space we start to sing and many times it's gayatri mantra om bur bua swaha and if she's hindu and then bismillah rahmani rahim allah akbar we're in a very sacred month now it's ramadan here in indonesia and all over the world and we we sing amazing grace to our christian mom so we have a lot of baby girls named grace um <laughs> And then we have, of course, Filipino songs, Catholic songs. We have Buddhist prayers. We really try to, um, to make sure that the circle of support, the golden chain of support that includes the mother's spiritual life, who does she talk to? Is it Mother Mary? Is it Saraswati? Is it, you know, who is it? Is it Allah? Whoever it is, is it Kuan Yim? Then, then we include her in our prayers while she's giving birth. Mm. So, I hear the amounts of times I just had chills. <laughs> we want every speak. baby to have a birth song, yeah. and then the parents report to us. And of course, I have grandchildren too. All of them are Bumi Seha babies. We have parents reporting back to us saying, "You know, sometimes when my baby cries, and the baby's been been breastfed, the baby's been burped, the baby's been clean diaper. There's no reason for this baby to cry. So we start singing the birth song, and the baby." starts smiling and it's just settles the baby it settles everyone our meditation at the beginning of this interview mm -hmm. is really what i needed today mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah oh just feeling the the holistic energy and the gentleness through everything that you just described i can mm -hmm. feel my system relaxing um, and it's quite fascinating i so I was born in Germany onto a land that has quite horrible history. And for a while, I was really um, studying into the history of the impacts of, of the generations to come. And one of the ripple effects from the Nazi regime is actually their teachings around childbirth and around how to be with newborns. And I just hearing you speak of, of the holistic nature and the gentleness and not separating the mother from the baby, there's something in me that was like, yes, we're going in the right direction because I know these days there's a lot of, a lot of things happening in the world that might make us question if as a human race, we actually are going forward yeah. and we are getting any better at this human thing. And hearing you speak, I'm like, yes, there are some areas where, where we are mm -hmm. connecting with the land, connecting with spirit, connecting with each other. And if one of those is out of balance, it does not work. It genuinely has to be all three. And so mm -hmm. thank you. Oh. Yeah. yeah. We you, do believe that we are creating peace, one mother baby at a yes. time. And you are. I've, I study a lot into neuroscience and what happens in these first in particular first two years right of all the mm -hmm. synapses and if you can create a healthy nervous system in during that pregnancy mm -hmm. and in those first few months you actually are changing the world because those humans can rest more in themselves and 
I feel that that is one thing that really stands out to me about the Balinese culture. The humans here, they have a different nervous system from a lot of my Western friends. There is, there is a more settled quality. There's just something that's a bit more at peace. And, mm -hmm. and what you're creating is, is growing that, which hallelujah, it's so needed where in a lot of other places, nervous systems are more and more out of whack. Right. And we know that there's that basic tenet of physics that, that systems are sensitive to their startup conditions. Dynamic systems are sensitive to their startup conditions. What is more dynamic than a human being? And if we traumatize human beings at the time that they're taking their first breath yeah. and they're opening their eyes on this earth for the first time, it's, it's profound. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, we used to always say it was the first 18 months to two years of life, psychologists would say, that's mm -hmm. when a person is made. Mm -hmm. But now, um, with, the, with the, the newest research is saying that people are made in the first hour or two of life. Mm -hmm. That's when their nervous systems mm -hmm. are learning so profoundly how to be in this world. Yeah. And we want our babies to grow up and be peace builders, earth protectors. Mm -hmm. you know, we want them to be gentle and intelligent, to have their full blood supply, their full intelligence, their full longevity, and their full spiritual wholeness and the only way that we have found that i have found in my life and the midwives of the Masehad and all over the world have found is that if we can do this by supporting the mother baby through pregnancy no matter where she comes to us from how whatever her traumas have been we need to be able to open to listen and to and to embrace her and be part of that circle of support because so many people come to us with broken chain of support there's yeah. there are no strong links or just a few yeah. and we need to help her and help repair those by restoring her trust mm -hmm. and life on earth it's a it's a hard time on earth but we do believe that we can build peace one mother baby at a time by making it possible for individuals to live their full potential i mean people in their optimal life are going to do miraculous beautiful things mm -hmm. i don't think anyone comes into the world with an optimal intact heart and soul that is going to do something bad. Mm -hmm. I'm so with you. Mm. Mm. You mentioned the phrase gentle birth. Mm. I, that's something you use quite a bit. I'd, mm. I'd love to hear if you can share a bit more what that means to you. Mm. I think it says on our t-shirts, gentle births, heal mother earth. Mm -hmm. oh, it means everything it's my passion it's why I get up in the morning get up in the middle of the night if there's an emergency uh, it's it's why I was born I believe it uh, I believe that all of the midwives that bring say hot were also born for that purpose the doulas that we train um, you know before the pandemic somewhere between six and ten thousand student midwives from all over Indonesia would visit Bumi Sehat. They would come on planes, trains, buses, any way they could. They would save their money and they would come in groups and we would greet them and we would do these beautiful programs with them, share everything. We have beautiful books that we share with them that are free. They can get them physically if they drop us a, a note and give us their address or if they come by Bumi Sehat or they can get them online. Many of them share them on their hand phones. I feel like we have this army of, of Indonesian and Filipino midwives that really are excited and on fire with this belief that gentle birth will heal Mother Earth. I mean, think about it. Think about it, how it is for a woman to go through the most challenging experience she can have physically, yeah. and yet she has to relax. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't do that without support and continuous care. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to me how many women do manage to give birth in hospitals and how many women are so brave and have so much strength and courage. I mean, we are just an extraordinary 
extraordinary beings. We really are. Yeah, we yeah. truly are. It, it, it's incredible what we can endure and in what conditions we can thrive but thrive i'm saying carefully there because mm. what we were just saying right that that being that truly comes completely held and regulated and seen and cared for will just have such a different setup to to thrive in terms of just feeling their soul and and naturally feeling open to others and drawn to others whereas if those conditions are differently, there might be. I know for myself, I had a long journey around mental health and around having to heal before I could actually fully be here and choose to be here. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how amazing would it be if we could save 30 years of these human lives to start from the get go being like, hi, I'm here. Mm -hmm. What can I create? What beauty can I create on this planet? Right. And um, so, yes, we can survive in many many extremely challenging conditions and it's so humbling to understand that and to strengthen the, the conditions to to get people set off mm -hmm. you're right i do see that it seems to me like most human beings are spending their first 30 or more years of life just trying to get through their layers of trauma mm -hmm. and just trying to function within the window in which they can function yeah. people are so brave and so beautiful and they're doing their best yeah they really are i see that for the most part yeah but i have an extraordinary life you know i get to be every day with my best friends um you know they don't need me at buma sehat at the clinic um but but i stop by no matter what mm -hmm. you know sometimes it's just They'll, they'll call me up and say, Iba Rabin, we have a patient here that needs you to hold their hand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's all I do. And of course, raising the funds to keep six clinics going in two countries, that's my big challenge. But, you know, through the pandemic, we met when this all started and we, we really tightened protocols for hygiene and everything in all of our clinics. And we talked about the possibility because the whole world going into economic strife. I mean, Bali, 80% unemployment. I mean... I have to say thank you for keeping your jewelry company, keeping Ananda Soul going and making jobs because that is essential mm -hmm. when you're going through something like, you know, it's been more than two years of people not having any income here. I mean, we went from just pretty much providing healthcare and, and services through education and, and things like prenatal yoga, elderly yoga, all of those services to having to provide food for about 200 families every two weeks yeah. just groceries so that they could eat for the next two weeks yeah. um, so when, but when that's all going on and I thought I need to face the fact that maybe we have to close a clinic it was impossible for me to imagine and the whole you know the board in the US the board here in Indonesia which is all Indonesians except for me they all said you know Ibu Robin you need to they might need to grow up a little and understand that we might have to close a clinic or two during the pandemic. And so I've really tried to accept that. But, you know, our contributors have supported us in such a profound way that we have not had to close. That's amazing. We have not had to reduce our services. We've increased our services. We've been able to feed people. Mm -hmm. We've been able to keep it going. Yeah. And you know, all of our all of our centers are open yeah. twenty four seven. Yeah. Yeah. And I as you're just saying, oh, Robin, you might need to grow up a little. It takes the ones of us that refuse to grow up around <laughs> certain areas because I certainly was told that and we had to reduce significantly in the beginning. And there was something in me where I spoke with God, whatever is out there, and was like, I will do whatever it takes. And we started doing the same, right? We started doing the food packages and mm -hmm. and people from all over the world just sent the most generous contribution. Mm -hmm. And as humanity has been going through this hardship, there's again this the sign where we show up for each other. Like we actually deeply care. And yes. so same thing. There was so much support. And yeah, we did make it through. And I was like, well, they're my family. We're going to somehow make it through this time. Yes. And what a relief we can all feel as 
It's very fresh. So I find myself like being a still, still a bit hesitant, but we are opening up. The island yeah. is opening up and I can feel the relief amongst mm -hmm. the people here because it has been tough and it's pretty we, difficult. We're getting through it and we're I feel there's there's light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned the funding piece, and, and I know you've had a huge journey with Rumi Sehat. Um, and a lot of you probably know that you also won CNN Hero. And I'm curious, what what happened with that? Like, what changes came to your, your own life? What changes came to Rumi Sehat? What was that whole experience like <laughs> in general? <laughs> yeah. That was pretty. That was pretty intense, mm -hmm. you know. Not just for me, but for our entire Bumi Sehat family, both here and in the Philippines. Um, yeah, it was. It was. It was big. I don't know. It was something like having all your dreams come true and being in the Hunger Games all at once. <laughs> <laughs> it's really. It's really wild because um, that was 2011, and all of the heroes in in my year. We're still in contact. We're still friends. Mm. The support and the love that they shared with us was just—it's uh, been amazing. And and the team here, you know, they set up a computer at Bumi Sehat outside in our little tiny space that we used to have. And our ambulance driver taught families in labor how to vote. <laughs> and when I I showed up one night because oh. there were just so many people giving birth. And I saw mothers voting in labor. I said, what are you doing making them do this in labor? Uh, and the mothers said to me, no, we want to do this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, just, you know, our friend from Melting Pot, he has a saloon, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> he had people voting there. And he, you know, he had a big free waffle breakfast on the morning so everybody could watch because he had cable TV. I don't, we didn't have cable. I mean, I didn't have cable TV at home. Um, we had hotels here who gave their employees the opportunity. They had a bank of computers set up to vote for me. I mean, how wonderful is that? And, you know, they had voting parties and they all, everyone in Bali got behind, got behind Bumi Sehat for that. And, and having a big prize money like that, you think it's going to solve all your financial problems. That was just the beginning. Because, of course, at that point, we realized that, The lease on the place where we were having, where we had our little tiny clinic was running out. I mean, we thought when we built that, that we'd never have to have worries again. We had a location, but the lease was running out and we needed to move to a bigger place because of the numbers of Bumi Sehat patients coming, their regulations and square footage. And we really had to, you know, we had to upgrade big time. Mm -hmm. And so that money was about half, as, less than half, about a third of what we needed to, once we figured out what we needed to build. But it also made midwife to mother care, it made doulas and midwives, uh, a word that most Americans didn't even know what a midwife was. It's interesting. Mm. Many of them didn't. Um, and so because so few families use midwifery care in the United States compared to Europe, I mean, Germany has beautiful midwives. Mm -hmm. You know, the midwives in their training in Germany, they train in homeopathy or traditional Chinese medicine, and often they choose both. Wow. Yeah. So it's really something special there. Yeah, in Europe, um, in, in Indonesia, where most babies are born, born into the hands of midwives, or the Philippines where that's the case and there's so much support for midwifery care but it suddenly in you know in America which is kind of I would say spiritually bankrupt uh, suddenly they were talking about gentle childbirth and creating peace one mother baby at a time mm -hmm. one family at a time and that was really and because of that we were able to raise the money we needed to finish building here and not only that uh, people came on board You know, we have a beautiful clinic in Aceh, the, mm -hmm. the rotaries here in, in um, the Ubud and the Bali area, Seminyak and Ubud, organized the funding for mm -hmm. us to build in a permanent facility in Aceh. I mean, people say, why are you still there? The tsunami's over. 
It's never over. It's never over when a mother loses all of her children. Um, it's, it's never over when two children are left with their great grandparents as their only care providers. Um, but, but it's, it's an amazing healing process being there in Aceh. Uh, we are in Lombok since the 2018 earthquakes and direct relief built that clinic. We're in Papua. Papua was hit so hard by the pandemic. You know, Papuan people are black. And when we talk about indigenous peoples and how affected they were by the, by the COVID-19 virus, it's, mm -hmm. it's a profound problem. Yeah. I mean, we need vitamin D to fight that virus. And when we have dark skin, we don't manufacture vitamin D when we're in the sun as well as light-skinned people. Mm -hmm. So a lot of indigenous people. I lost my closest cousin in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, my uncle, one of our midwives on our team, our head midwife, Farida Salman, in Papua, who had just been in February and March, she was here in Bali, living in my home, working at Bumi Sehat, really getting excited about the Bumi Sehat protocols and brought those back to our, our Papuan midwives. She was such an important part of our community and her family. And um, yeah, she died in July mm -hmm. of that year of 2020. So we've all lost people yeah. and we've all gone through so much yeah. yeah it's really for me it's been an exercise in in really hoping and praying to great spirit divine creator whoever it is we feel most blessed to pray with uh, we needed to pray to have everyone's inner knowing awakening yeah that's been what it's been for me mm -hmm. yeah so with you Hmm. I'd love to, to speak a bit about the, the birth experience itself. Mm -hmm. um, because many women, especially first-time mothers, mm -hmm. there's a great sense of anxiety and fear that comes with it, fear of the unknown, um, something could go wrong. What are some ways how you, how you hold that? how you teach them to like instill some some trust um yeah hmm. that's a beautiful question how do we instill trust in mothers to be especially the first time or if they've had a traumatic birth experience mm -hmm. which is very common in the world uh, i just read today that um reporting of birth trauma is actually increased in the last two years rather than decreased. So internationally, it's a big problem. One of the things that the midwives do at Bumi Sehat is they always say, we provide prenatal care, which is very different from prenatal scare. <laughs> so when you have that opportunity, and remember, everyone can come to Bumi Sehat whether they have money or not. Um, we don't charge. So they can have free prenatal care, free childbirth services, excellent postpartum care. They don't have to think about how they're gonna pay for it. And that is, I think that's a number one human right is healthcare is a human right, but it's not free. I mean, our, our contributors make it possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm always in gratitude for all of them, but just, being able to have a woman sit with us. And, and now it's different. You know, our desks have these plastic enclosures. Mm -hmm. We're wearing masks. But the midwives always say, you can't see me smile, but can you see my eyes smiling right now? Um, I love it when our midwives, the mother's now laying down and her belly's being palpated and measured. And before using a Doppler, which is a wonderful life-saving advice, a device that the mother can hear her baby's heartbeat and we can know if it's normal or not. But for the midwives to put their ear down on the mother's belly and say, excuse me, can I connect with your baby before we use the device? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, there's such a thing as high technology care, which has its place, but we're more high touch care. <laughs> and the mothers love it. And we teach her partner. We teach her her baby daddy, her husband. Not all families have 
a mommy and a daddy. Some of our families have a mommy and a mommy. But we teach her partner how to put their ear down on the mother's belly. First of all, where is the mother feeling kicking? It's up here. Oh, okay. If those are the feet, this is the baby's butt. This is the baby's back. This is the baby's head. We have the mom take her hands and feel her baby's head. So she says, oh, my baby's head down. And then she might say, well, I went to this one doctor who told me that my baby was head up and I needed a cesarean. And we say, well, that was 25 weeks. And look at here, we have charts that show the size of the baby, the actual size by the number of weeks. And we say, almost all babies are up, head up at 25 weeks. And then we, we take that chart at the week she is and we put it on her belly so that, and then we have them take pictures with her hand phone. We take pictures so that she can see and she can show her other children and her family what stage of development her baby's in. We really try to give autonomy to each and every person, you know, so that they, you know, whether they have COVID or they have diabetes or they have hypertension or they're pregnant, all of our people that come to Bumi Sehat for, for assistance, we try to give them health autonomy. I just did a book on on Damamberdara, on dengue fever, but and it's in English and in, in Bahasa Indonesia, so that people know when they face dengue fever, how they can help themselves to, to get better quickly and to also not die. Yeah. How do you not die when you have dengue fever? It's It can be a killer. And we have a book called Ibu Alami, Natural Mother, mm -hmm. that you know gives mothers all those tips that they need to be able to understand what's going on with them and also to acknowledge that we're open to their questions. And we try to answer a lot of their questions in the book, but she's really welcomed and invited to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Anak Alami, what's a normal temperature for a baby, natural child? What's a, what's a normal temperature? You know, what does newborn baby poop look like? I've had pa families panic because right. they, if they're in the hospital and the baby's taken away and then the first poop or two, happen in the nursery, then when they get their baby back and they see this black poop come out, they go into a panic, you know? And Bumi Seha is always willing mm -hmm. to help, mm -hmm. you know, no matter where you uh, have your baby. Women should feel that they should, they could give birth where they feel safe. And some people mm -hmm. feel safer in a hospital. And if they have certain risk factors, it is safer for them in the hospital, mm -hmm. you know? And I want to say to the mothers that are listening that, if you've had a belly birth or a cesarean, I just want to say thank you because it's it's big. Mm -hmm. And I feel like mothers who've had belly births sometimes feel like they failed as mothers or they failed their baby. They didn't fail. You know, sometimes you have to go to the far reaches of science and have a major abdominal surgery to get your baby earth side. Yeah. And some mothers... They do have to ask that question. Did I need this cesarean birth? Did I need this belly birth or not? It doesn't matter whether you needed it or not. That was your baby's miracle. Mm -hmm. And a birth, no matter how it happens, no matter where it happens. And believe me, in the Philippines after the the big typhoon, we delivered a baby in a Coca-Cola truck. You know? We've delivered babies by the side of the road. We've delivered babies in tents. But we always say the mothers really do the delivery. We just are catchers. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's it's amazing to me how important it is that mothers are thanked and blessed. Whatever happened, that was a miracle. No matter what the trauma was, and sometimes a mother can have what looks like a gentle, natural childbirth, but she might have trauma mm -hmm. because you you don't know. You don't know what her traumas are. You know, I just um, heard about someone who had trauma because in the hospital she felt totally safe and she really loved her OB and she loved her, the, there was a maternity nurse there and a midwife there. But when they closed the door for her birth, they locked it. Oh, wow. And that was just procedure at that hospital. Mm -hmm. But for her, she had been sexually abused behind a locked door. So when she saw the door being locked, she went into complete panic mode. Mm -hmm. So... We don't know, and you know, oftentimes we just don't know whether that mother has had, you know, some kind of abuse. I would say most women are survivors mm -hmm. of something, yeah. and so as midwives at Bumi Sehat and as doulas, 
those that are those that are people that are non-medical that are supporting the mother just through continuous care we have to really be sensitive to the fact that you know most most women are survivors of one kind or another mm -hmm. and that we have to really be open to allowing her to lead us to the kind of care that will make her feel comfortable and supported and loved and cared for yeah. that won't put her into a panic or a trauma state or you know that sometimes though she'll be in flight but you know fight or flight but she could go into to freeze yeah. and we have to make sure that yeah, we don't, don't want them. in any way re-injure her mm -hmm. yeah mm. i love that combination of, of instilling trust by by creating that cocoon of you welcome here and like no question is a bad question just come and here's all the information and then honoring the the perfection of what needs to happen with that unique being bringing through a unique being and mm -hmm. kind of reclaiming belly birth and all the bits right where you're like mm -hmm. this is how it's meant to be and it's okay like i can feel myself relax as we're i feel there, there's so many rules that we're being told of like this is how you should do it you know mm -hmm. doesn't just apply to this applies to pretty much anything in life and to be like thank you that was your miracle and it was perfect that that's how it was meant to happen yeah mm. thank you um I'm going to go into like some some cultural pieces. I'm curious actually how if they're present here in Indonesia as well. Um, I just know as, as women like having been raised in a in a Western country, there's a lot of pressure to appear unchanged at childbirth birth, um, physically. Right. So mm -hmm. we should bounce back like there's a certain amount of weeks and then you should bounce back and mentally as well. Right. We should. Like just be able to perform. What are your insights um, you can share with women in general around that concept and how to holistically recover physically, spiritually, mentally, like how to really take care of themselves and potentially reprogram some of those beliefs that might have been planted in there? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I love that question. Um, my first book was called After the Baby's Birth, mm. A Woman's Way to Wellness. And um, I wrote it because I was invited by Mothering Magazine to do an article on postpartum. Mm. And at that point, I was, let's see, I was, I was about to have my third baby. And then uh, I started to do research on what, what resources were out there. For postpartum mothers I couldn't find almost anything almost mm -hmm. nothing and then there was this book that was called the third trimester and as someone who already had two children was expecting my third baby I was I was really upset by that title and really nothing against the author but the third trimester yeah it's catchy but it does that mean that in you know in three months you gotta have it all back together that's pretty that's pretty harsh and you know the United States is where I was raised even though I'm Filipino I was shocked and still shocked to hear that there's still no universal paid leave for our new mothers there I mean there are people who are trying to legislate they're trying to negotiate it's kind of now been put to state to state but mothers are not getting the kind of care they need. I mean, the World Health Organization says exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of a baby's life is optimal for health. And when you have a mother who could do that, do you know that the average health care savings for the life of that baby, if they're breastfed exclusively for the first six months of life, this, the health care systems however they're paid for, I mean, in the U.S. we don't have universal health care really yet, but however they're paid for, it's $100,000 or more. <laughs> That's the money that would wow. be saved. That money could go into education. Yeah. That money could go into improving quality of life, feeding people healthy food, you know, mm -hmm. 
putting putting healthy organic nails on the plates of children in schools. Wow. But instead, because we're bringing children into the world and we're not able to optimally feed them, mothers don't fail to breastfeed. Not all mothers breastfeed, but mothers who want to breastfeed don't fail to breastfeed. Their systems, their their support systems fail them. You know, the healthcare system, the family system, all of that, it fails them. You know, and any traumas that they have before, if they're not able to get the support they need to to get beyond those traumas, but then what happens is that trauma baton gets passed to the next generation and the next generation. And of course, then we have babies that are not living their optimal health. And then they go through the healthcare system. And by the end of their life, it's over $100,000 more to take care of them. Mm-hmm. So it's really important what happens postpartum. Mm-hmm. And we really, you know, we give really a lot of postpartum care because people don't have to pay for it. They can stay as long as they want it when they say hi. The midwives go out on motorcycles. Anyone has a breastfeeding question or incident or anything, someone's out the door. Two midwives on a motorcycle are out there making sure that you're supported. But I feel like this this body shaming of women has got to stop. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, our bodies come in so many shapes and sizes and they're all beautiful. What's more beautiful than a breastfeeding mother? Oh my goodness. Uh, it's really it's really important that we support women wherever they are physically and and we give them as much support as possible. But it's so subtle. I mean uh, someone, some who was it who? Someone, someone said to me, "What are you doing later today?" And it was, it was a few days ago, and I said, "Oh, I'm going to be going over and having a an Ananda Soul uh, interview." And they said, "Ananda Soul, oh my gosh, I just saw an ad of theirs where there was an elder woman. I think it was Aska from Earth Company. She's a, she's a change maker." Mm-hmm. Um, and she said, yes, yeah. she said, I saw this, one of their uh, photos modeling their jewelry was an older woman. And she said, and I fell in love with that photo. So, you know, I mean, even if we bounce back from having our first or a second baby and we're, we, you know, we look sexy again and we get our yoga clothes back on, you know, we're going to get older. I'm 65 now. You know, uh, my mom is at, my mom's turning 90 in June. She goes, why don't you dye your hair? And I go, I earn these white hairs, you know? Your body's gonna change. You're not gonna fit into your genes. And isn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could feel loved and supported and sexy no matter what, mm-hmm. sensual, mm-hmm. you know? No matter what age you are, no matter what, how many kilos you're walking around in, you know, it just our bodies are changing and growing, and and they're not always comfortable. You know, mm-hmm. my knees hurt. My knees hurt a lot. Um, but just if we could support women to be who they are, to to be beautiful wherever they're at, I would be so happy. Mm-hmm. There's a business here called Perfect Fit, and another one called Move, and they're making um, menstrual underwear. Mm-hmm. I just heard about that. I oh need my to gosh. get my hands. You need to get some. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, here are women run, women concepts, women owned and operated businesses that are making women's lives more comfortable. It's a game changer. I mean, and uh, just stigmatizing things like when, when is it okay to talk about our bleed and to, mm. you know, it's, it's just like it's time to destigmatize and to, actually claim our own bodies in all the phases yes. like genuinely in all the phases because i feel there's just still far too little education around around the stages like mm-hmm. and especially as we become older and when menopause starts coming in and all mm-hmm. these questions mm-hmm. and the body's changing and, and menopause i think it's an 11 year I used to think it was a 10-year process, but I realized that 11 is such a sacred number. And mm-hmm. It seems to me like mine was an 11-year process. When I talk to more and more women, they say, oh, yeah, mine was an 11-year process. Wow. And it doesn't have to be a, 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 a sorrowful or difficult or painful or, a, you know, it doesn't have to be a medical emergency. It can mm-hmm. be a joyful process. Yeah. 
But then again, you know, I live in a bubble. You know, our menopausal women get acupuncture for free at Women's Day Hot. Mm-hmm. So the women in the villages are just like, yes. <laughs> so my new passion right now is I'm writing a book called Pilihan Dan Tantangan, Choices and Challenges. Mm-hmm. It's actually finished and it's being illustrated by a young uh, cartoonist, uh, comic Ooh. book artist in Gyanyar, here in Ooh. Gyanyar. <laughs> Um, Bulan, uh, so she's really hard at work at it, and um, it's a, it's exciting because we want to the the part about menstruating and having your moon and all of that, and about the functions of the woman's body and what's happening with the boy's bodies, what's happening with the girls' bodies. That's called celebrating the cycle. Mm-hmm. We're really into it, but also questions. I mean, teenagers want to know how do I deal with stinky feet. You know, how do I deal with, you know, it's the tropics. What if I get lice? You know, I'm in the ninth grade. I'm scared to death. And that someone's going to find out that my head itches. All these things, like how to give the teenagers a little manual. You get, you buy a hand phone, you get a little booklet. I love that. Yeah. Oh, and, I wish, I wish. Yeah. Yeah. I'd add that. It would make a huge difference. It, it, I hope so. Yeah. We spent years, um, we did a thing called Ask the Midwife. Mm-hmm. We have a youth center at Bumi Seha, a youth education center. It's kind of, it started out as a hobby and turned out to be a passion. And uh, every month, the midwives would go in and there would be a basket and it would be full of questions. And they were provided with um, beautiful pens. We would give them a purple pen, but they had to ask a question and put it on a piece of paper, anonymously throw it in the basket. And then the midwives would open those. They would be folded up and sometimes crumpled up and they'd open them up, you know, there are, there are young women who are asking the question, what is an erection? Mm-hmm. You know, that's a real question. Somebody should answer, but they don't have anyone to ask that question to, you know, and all of them, the boys and the girls had beautiful questions. Those questions, we compiled them mm. and we saved them. And mm. we now have written a book for the teenagers. Soon it will be mm. released. Yeah, we're, we're excited about mm. Pili Han Dan Tan Tan Choices and Challenges. Mm-hmm. Because again, we try to support people through, you know, at Bumi Sehat, we have prenatal yoga, we have prenatal care, we have childbirth education classes to try to help to make sure that women feel prepared when they come into labor. There's nothing that can prepare you. Okay. The thing that Mother Nature does, though, because we're going back to a previous question, um, the thing that Mother Nature and Father Time do is that when you have those first contractions, when you're having your first baby, they start out slowly and gently. And they feel like you're going to have your moon. Hmm. And I have mothers call me up in the middle of the night sometimes or or they'll text me and they'll say, I might be in labor, but I'm not sure because it just feels like I'm having my moon cramping. (laughs) And then I'll say, yeah, and there's a clear beginning and a clear end. It doesn't feel like like the early practice contractions, the Braxton Hicks contractions. You can have a 30-minute contraction. You know, and that's just your uterus, which is the strongest muscle in the world, by the way. And men don't have one. <laughs> so we women have the strongest muscle in the world in our bodies. We're born with them. And that uterus will practice, but it'll be like a long, drawn out, and then eventually it will subside. But the real contractions that mean your labor is really the beginning that the baby has started the labor. It has a clear beginning and a clear end. It might only last 10 seconds, but it does feel like your moon is coming. And since you haven't had your moon for nine months, you're like, yeah, I just feel like I'm gonna have my period. And I go, that's the one. Mm. Well, that's not a big deal. I'm Mm -hmm. like, there you go. And then you relax. You're like, I can handle that. I've handled that many months before. Yeah. And you know, Mm. my daughter who had the really intense desmonorrhea, the, the kind of menstrual cramping that would you know send her into into trauma and vomiting and you know a couple times a year I would bring her to boom and say hot we put her on IVs because she couldn't handle it mm. it was so painful and then the hyperemesis that comes with it if you if you're she had a four hour and forty four minute labor because she's like oh yeah this is I can <laughs> do this <laughs> I can do this she went into labor during her blessing way. Wow. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I saw her first one. She went, oh, my gosh. Yeah, something's, mm. something cool is happening here. Mm. So we really, you know, we women were born mm-hmm. to have our bodies do all of their jobs, mm-hmm. you know, from, you know, menstruating to having a baby to recovering postpartum. And then our bodies were born to grow old gracefully. Mm-hmm. 
and to grow in our youth gracefully, but we do need some guideposts, some kind of framework to hang that on. And I feel like that's what our, our new health book is going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm, amazing. I love how many phases of life you're, you're honoring and, and serving really. Um, there's, there's one pocket of women that I'd love to speak to, um, the ones that are, that are calling in a spirit and are, are working on their fertility. I know you at Rumi Sehat also have a section mm-hmm. that is for fertility. And I'm just wondering if there's any wisdom you can give for women who are currently wanting to become mothers. Yes. That's a big question because mm-hmm. actually fertility issues are really on the increase mm-hmm. internationally. So we do, um, I will say that, that um, one of the things that really helps and really works is acupuncture. And anyone in Bali can come to Bumi Sehat and get that for free. And our acupuncturist also, um, she does do private so that people that do have money that want something private in their home and treat the couple, treat mm-hmm. the couple. Mm-hmm. They'll never forget this amazing couple, uh, European and Javanese woman. And for eight years, they tried to get pregnant. They tried everything. In fact, they had two IVF attempts that didn't work. Mm-hmm. And our acupuncturist felt their pulses and said to the mother, uh, the mother-to-be, she said, you know what? Just get on the table. You're exhausted and you're emotionally wrung out by this whole thing. You're fine. And felt the husband's pulse. And she said, wow, something's going on. You have so much blood stagnation. I bet you have no sperm count. Well, he didn't even want to go there because he knew he had a low sperm count and he had already tested it. And he's a medical doctor. And he was like, mm. and he's not going to tell this acupuncturist, a holistic doctor. And he's a medical doctor. He didn't want to tell her that, you know, yeah, he has very bad blood stagnation. In fact, she nailed it. She said, I think you have like a, a heart, a heart problem. Something's wrong with your heart. And it's making your blood be stagnant and it's making your body not make sperm. Get on the table. Well, he called me up a few hours later and said, is she a witch? <laughs> he was actually born with an, uh, an atypical, uh, inoperable heart arrhythmia, that heart a condition that could not be solved. He grew up in hospitals and that's why he ended up being a doctor. And he was really good at it. He was doing amazing work. Um, but... But within that one cycle, that next cycle, because he got acupuncture treatments at Bumi Sehat, they conceived a baby. And his heart arrhythmias stopped. Yeah, he he continued to get acupuncture until Mm -hmm. still now, every once in a while, he'll feel something is not quite right and he'll come in for a treatment. They have two daughters now. They feel Mm -hmm. super blessed. And they're one of the Bumi Sehat miracles. So we do help a lot of couples. Mm To um, And it's something, when you have a couple that goes through, it's not one or two, you know, this was a particular case where the first treatment worked, the first acupuncture treatment, because it was a simple case of blood stagnation. Mm -hmm. Apparently only 15% of people who are diagnosed infertile are honestly infertile. Mm -hmm. But if you do come and you do acupuncture for three or four months, and you still haven't achieved the pregnancy that you so dream of, then really there are people like Dr. Hariasa and we have people doing now here in Bali and all over the world doing IVF and IVF is really a blessing. A lot of people think, Oh, it's not natural. And you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to fail. You know, if you've done yoga all your life, like me, you think you got to be all natural, but sometimes you need a little help, better living through science. The thing about IVF is IVF is really good at helping you achieve pregnancy. They're not good at helping you keep the pregnancy and hold the pregnancy, but acupuncture is. Mm. And so like in California, my daughter, who's um, a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine, um, she was inspired by Bumi Sehat. She grew up there. She saw how Chinese medicine was working. And so when she made the decision which branch of medicine to go to, she decided to become a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. And she's half Chinese, so that's good. (laughs) And also she, um, she did her PhD in reproductive health. Mm-hmm. And in California, she was working with the OBGYNs doing IVF. Mothers would come to these practices all over from all over the world because of the success rate. And you know what they were doing differently? 
the the OBGYN would have the mother do acupuncture in the morning, IVF in the afternoon, acupuncture the next day. Hmm. And they had wow. incredible success rate of being able to hold the baby. Mm -hmm. And then these mothers would go back to wherever they came from, or sometimes they were from that part of Northern California, but they would continue to have acupuncture treatments. And it's wonderful. And it's free when we say hi. And of course, people can make donations, but it's a beautiful thing. And we love it when people have um, had challenges conceiving and then they have their, then they, they get their baby and then they, they oftentimes will birth at Bumi Sehat because it's the place they feel mm -hmm. most safe. A lot of doctors come to Bumi Sehat to have mm. their babies. We love that. <laughs> we love that. And mm. we have a brilliant team. It's yeah. headed up by Dr. Dayu. She's a brilliant, mm -hmm. you know, she looks like she's in high school because she's so young and spry and full of energy, but she's actually a seasoned, very, mm -hmm. very gifted doctor. Amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. I have one last question around how you keep your balance you're a mother of here running this clinic or created this clinic there's all these branches what are some of the things that help you to be able to show up in the ways that you are thank you i have six grandchildren mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're really say hot babies and my daughter who is a doctor of traditional chinese medicine who would she did have a belly birth the first time because there was an emergency. And that that belly birth, I'm talking to my belly birth moms all over the world, and my cesarean moms, because I want to say thank you. That saved my grandson's life mm -hmm. and her life because mm -hmm. the placenta had erupted. Mm -hmm. And so it was really, really important that she was so open to not questioning and just saying, okay, I need this now for my baby and my own safety. And thank you, mom, for supporting me in it. And we went to the hospital and we did that. Um, with the second baby, she was born completely naturally. She's one of our wonderful vaginal birth after cesarean miracles, a VBAC miracle baby. And I got to go back to the question. <laughs> what supports me? What keeps me glued together? Um, I guess I mentioned my grandchildren, having six of them. My, my first grandchild's 25 years old. Yeah, she's a gift. And then the youngest one is a year and a half. We have all sizes in between. Five of them are here. One is in, in the U.S. So I have a family that's really big and supportive family. My husband is incredible. He, you know, this morning I was teaching from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. online. And while I was doing teaching, he brought me breakfast. He brought me, a, you know, not only a cup of tea, but a whole thermos so I could keep refilling and have my morning Earl Grey caffeine tea. He's really, he's really there for me. He, um, he does all kinds of wonderful things constantly to keep Bumi Sehat going and to support Bumi Sehat because, you know, I do have eight children. His, mine, ours, and, and, and you know, so I got three of them free. I gave birth five times. And, uh, you know, he's, he's just been great. My children have been great. You know, they do, my, my son's an artist. He does illustrations for our books. My daughter, Lakota, is an environmentalist and, and um, a filmmaker. And, a, and um, she lays my books out. My mm. daughter, Zoe, has laid out some of my books. My daughter, Zoe, keeps when we say hi, help, helps with that. Uh, my my son Hanuman is an EMT and he's helped to evacuate people from here to to the U.S. when needed. Um, I just have beautiful children mm. that have helped in every possible way. My son Noel is a yoga teacher, and mm. my daughter in love Lena keeps the um, prenatal yoga classes going for almost 15 years now. She coordinates that, and um, she and Ava are the teacher teachers for that. Uh, elder yoga at Bumi Sehat. I mean, all of these things, you know. And I live with my mother. Mm -hmm. So my mother's turning 90. We have four generations at home. Um, I mean, we have a 90-year-old and we have a one-and-a-half-year-old all living in a cluster of houses all together in Bali. I work with a team that is so supportive and so amazing. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing to work with your best friends and mm -hmm. people that really genuinely love you and that you love that's something that is probably rare in the world um yeah so i 
I stay glued together because I have lots of help. I don't think anyone was born to do it alone. Yeah. And anyone who's been through traumas, you know, as especially women, they tend to be like, you know, I'll do it myself. I can be strong. And it's great to be strong. But you know what? We're stronger together. Mm -hmm. And so we need to really love and support each other. You know, I remember years ago, it was right after the CNN thing, and we had our first group of student doulas come over. And, and it was so, it was early 2012. And um, three of our young student doulas, promise doulas, they were uh, from the US and they were college students. And about the third or fourth day into the training, they, the one started crying and then all of them started crying. And the three of them, the college students, young women were sitting together and they were holding hands. And we just waited and finally one of them said, I just need to say something. And she said, I've never been in a group of women before this where I didn't feel like I was in competition with the other women. We're not competing. And that's never happened before. I sat with the Bumi Sehat midwives and with Deborah Pascali Benaro and Catherine Bromhall and, and Ibu Yeshli from Jakarta. And, you know, all of, all of these women together doing this training. And I couldn't believe that three college students from the United States of America had never sat in a group of women. Now, that doesn't happen in Bali. In Bali, these women make offerings together and they do everything together. And they're not in competition. Well, they might be kind of competing on who has the prettiest kabaya. But they really are really together. All ages. All different economic situations. In the villages. Women are together. It really feels like we're coming full circle on that on the chain, right? And, the, and each link is needed. To, that's what, what I what I'm just inviting actually each woman who's listening to this to bring this back to to become more vulnerable to make it okay to sit together and to share mm -hmm. because the moment we do that it's like oh my god you too me too it the mm -hmm. moment we, we let these guards down and we reach out to each other the the types of families that can be formed that we need that many cultures have lost that are such a strong foundation and for you to be able to create what you create in the in the very thing that you're naming is like it is it is my family it is my support system mm -hmm. and that is how i can create these offerings that create a better world mm -hmm. a healthier calmer kinder world yeah that golden the, chain that golden chain. i have an incredible big long golden chain of support yeah. And I just ask all women out there to, you know, if you don't have a golden chain of support, open yourself up to it, yeah. you know, and Make know it. that there are women out there just like you that need each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 kind of, um, it's almost cruel to say make it happen because it's not so easy. And it's I really easy. acknowledge it's not easy. You know, when we were, um, we were meeting with uh, people, a couple here that live here in Bali that, uh, they're part of Melville Foundation, and they've given money for uh, disaster relief when we had the earthquakes and the volcano eruptions here. And, and Melville Foundation uh, gave the seed money for the Pilihan and Tantangan, which is, and we're doing what's called a Datang Bulan, which is your menstrual period. Mm -hmm. It's called The Moon is Here in Bali. It's mm -hmm. not called your period. It's called The Moon is Here. Mm -hmm. We're doing the Datang Bulan Revolution with a small R and a big E because it's the evolution that I'm focused on. And that's the revolution right now. We have a small R and a big E. And that's the, the revolution, the re-evolution that women are really, really embracing now with their yoga practices, with everything that they do all, all the time, with their charitable work, their, you know, with their families, with their friends, with their businesses. I'm just so excited about it. But so that, and that's part of like all of our staff has the menstrual underwear, which is environmentally so much friendlier. 12 billion 
uh, what are they called? Mm-hmm. Menstrual pads yes. that are non-biodegradable are tossed away. They're not thrown away. They're not away. They're still here. Yeah. They're tossed out in Indonesia a year, 12 billion a year in this country. That's just, in That's just Indonesia, and they're not biodegradable. Yeah. So these underwear, these beautiful menstrual panties, I love them, the Datang Bulan panties. So we're doing this revolution. We're going to be in the schools pretty soon in the next few months, and not only just saying to young girls, and, you know, in schools in Ganyar, they have families that, you know, haven't had a, a gaji, haven't had a salary for two years during the pandemic. So you need to go buy this menstrual underwear. No, you know, girls all over Indonesia drop out of school because they're on their, they're on their Datangulan, their moon, and they don't have the money to buy the pads. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of them are telling me they're using cardboard and paper and anything they can find to put in their underpanties. And then, and then they need their privacy because they, they can't be really washing their, their bloody underpanties and hanging them up. Mm-hmm. So they're trying to dry them under their beds. Well, they get moldy and they're not healthy. Mm-hmm. And so we've really come up with the idea of trying to provide these and getting donors to yes. provide, by the way, ladies out there, if you want to donate to something, to provide, and that's why um, Perfect Fit and Move, who's uh, which is a new menstrual underwear organization here, beautiful business. and. Perfect Fit's a beautiful business. They're helping us to get donations so that we can support these women-led businesses and and then try to provide them for girls and women all over in the poor areas so that they can do something healthy for their bodies and also be environmentally helping the Mother Earth to survive. We're all worried about that, yeah. and we all have to do our part. We really do. Thank you for mentioning. We're going to put the links of everything that Eva Robin mentioned in the show notes. If you feel called to support, there's many ways to do so. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. So much. Yeah. Terima kasih. Yeah. It's been amazing talking to you. Yeah. Same. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I please ma- the women out there, just try not to do it alone. Yeah. Try to do it with the help because we're all stronger together. Yeah. We need each other Mm -hmm. at every age. Oh, at every stage of our evolution. It does not stop. Yeah. Thank you.